absolutely save the town. I think the town would have just really disintegrated. There would be, I don't, it's hard to say, but I suspect that if the buildings hadn't been saved, the town as a center just wouldn't be here. There'd be a community, but its mayor's center would be Haverhill or, or, or Amesbury or some other larger town. I don't think that financially it could have survived. we found when we entered the mayor's office after six years in the city council was certainly a negative one and, and the first thing we did was try to change the attitude of the public in the sense of not change them but to make them more aware of our own community and we've done this I think I think we're, we're well on the road to an economic recovery in this community This is a chance that has come in, say, 300 years. A chance comes to a city to rearrange its landscape, make it more beautiful, make it more lasting, and it should be used uh, to the hilt. I mean, a delay of a year or two years is nothing when you think that the buildings that are there are going to set the tone the aesthetic tone for the next 100 or 200 years. The issue is urban quality. The city is Newburyport, Massachusetts. I see in many cities, people, young people going away. Here I see them staying or coming back. I think there is an authentic quality of life here that has to do with the scale, has to do with the water, has to do with the boats bobbing. The landscape is the legacy of the 18th and 19th centuries when Newburyport was a major maritime center. At the time of the American Revolution, it was one of the leading towns in the country. Shipbuilding, trade and privateering brought great wealth to Newburyport. This in turn generated a quality of architecture and urban design matched by few cities. In the 19th century, progress bypassed Newburyport. While the elegance of her architectural heritage remained, her economy declined. The population stabilized at 14,000 and stayed constant for the next century. In the 1960s, Newburyport looked to urban renewal as a catalyst for economic redevelopment. People had come to associate the old brick buildings of the downtown with continued economic stagnation. They hoped that by replacing Newburyport's 19th century business district, commercial vitality could be restored. And when the urban redevelopment program began to grow or began to become operative in Newburyport, these bulldozers came in and in a matter of a few days they just stripped the soil. Uh, there were wastelands, there were dust bowls where once there had been uh, rather beautiful buildings, uh, buildings that dated back to the 1800s and even before that. And I think people used to look at them with the sense that, well, they're outmoded or they're in a state of decay and they should be replaced by something better. But when they actually saw them coming down and the bare earth there, they had this cataclysmic sense of destruction. It was like a bomb dropping somewhere. The bomb was urban renewal. The target was downtown Newburyport. In an attempt to draw shoppers back into the downtown, provisions were made for extensive parking. One-story structures were planned as replacements for the existing three-story commercial buildings. In effect, the plan was an attempt to transplant the suburban shopping center concept to the heart of downtown Newburyport. Then you come down one day and it's all gone. And it's a terrible sort of gap tooth kind of thing. Uh, you try in vain to remember what uh, what was there, and you find you can't. 
In fact, there was a whole street there that was wiped out, and that street had a whole character of its own. In demolishing buildings and streets, urban renewal destroyed patterns of everyday life which had existed for generations. This etching of Newburyport, made in 1774, shows many of the relationships essential to understanding the city's physical character. The setting at the mouth of a great river, once a highway for trade with the rest of the world. The dominance of church spires and ships' masts, evidence of two major forces in the town's early economic and social life. The existence of common space held in trust by the town for public use in the 18th century for grazing and watering livestock. The compactness and communal qualities of its domestic and commercial architecture. Between 1774 and 1884, Newburyport's population grew from 3,000 to 14,000. While the town grew, the streets and buildings of the downtown retained their intimate scale and character. People moved easily within the town on a well-developed public transportation system. The streetcar system, with 128 miles of track, served Newburyport and connected the city to other towns of the Merrimack Valley. The transition to the automobile marked the beginning of the physical erosion of buildings and public spaces. As the auto replaced public transportation, downtown business became dependent on parking. Soon, off-street lots were necessary. To create them, buildings were demolished. Wolf's Tavern, a community gathering point for 200 years, was replaced by a service station. Before the automobile, Newburyport's downtown had a rich texture of buildings, alleys and streets, supporting a great variety of activities and uses. By 1965, large spaces had been carved for parking. Open areas had been enlarged by the demolition of unused waterfront buildings which had fallen into disrepair. Four years later, urban renewal demolished much of what remained of the downtown, destroying what was left of its intimate pedestrian-oriented quality. For some cities, this would be the beginning of a downtown development program marked by department stores and office blocks. In Newburyport, the shock of demolition marked the beginning of a concerted effort to preserve what remained of her 18th and 19th century architecture. Once slated for demolition, these buildings were saved. It took insight in 1965 to see that behind the clutter of signs, aluminum storefronts and painted bricks were structures that were historically valuable and commercially sound. The buildings exist today renovated rather than demolished. Their existence can be credited to a small coalition of citizens, both long-term residents and newcomers, who could foresee that economic redevelopment and the preservation of Newburyport's character were not incompatible. I guess we really got involved with these about 10 years ago. I got involved by being uh on a committee of concerned people who just felt that this was too important a uh, section to be torn down and just turned into a run-of-the-mill shopping center. Um, we said simply, don't tear them down, let's think about it, look at them. Uh, at that point, uh, when proposals were, were brought forth, I became involved as a banker. Uh, we're financing uh, one of these parcels. We feel it's a very solid investment. I opened my business because Newburyport appealed to me and I wanted to live here. Um, if, they had, if they had demolished the buildings and built a shopping mall, probably not. I would have looked for a small community that was still intact. Um, I, it's important to me the way the town feels, the, the, the quality of life that goes on here. Um, I'm not interested in, in spending my day in a, in a chrome-plated shopping mall. In saving the buildings, Newburyport has conserved an important part of her townscape and heritage. 
Market Square is probably the finest federal period commercial center existing today. Lower State Street and Market Square had always been Newburyport's commercial center, serving in the early days as a produce and fish market. As the city grew, it became necessary to organize and regulate marketing activities. A public market house was built in 1823. To regulate international trade, a United States Custom House was built in 1835. Both the market and custom houses were special buildings. Their design and prominent locations reflect their unique importance to the community. But the character and durability of Market Square was more dependent on the commercial buildings. They enclosed Market Square and framed its entrances from all the major streets. Considering that they were built by many separate businessmen, they reflect a notable consensus of design. They were built after a great fire in 1811, a fire which spread through 16 acres of wooden structures. In rebuilding the business district, the city passed an ordinance outlining standards for new construction. It required that the buildings be of brick and granite and that firewalls and chimneys extend above the roof line to prevent the spread of fire. As an early example of urban renewal, Market Square established the value of cooperative effort in creating an enduring architecture. With the restoration of roof lines, repairing of brick, and replacement of windows, the buildings have been returned to the more coherent appearance they had in the 19th century. The effort to reclaim Newburyport's downtown extends beyond the restoration of buildings. Streets that had once been open to the automobile are now being reclaimed for the pedestrian. Utility poles and telephone lines have been buried through the cooperative effort of the community and the utility companies. Federal and state funds, which were originally limited to auto traffic improvements, are being spent in pedestrian amenities, like brick and granite paving. City and urban renewal funds have been used for street lighting more compatible to the scale and character of the architecture. Businessmen have conformed to sign control restrictions, enhancing the appearance of buildings and suggesting a new awareness of the importance of maintaining a unified character in the downtown. The restoration of Newburyport's downtown has created a climate of confidence whose effect is visible outside the urban renewal area. The incentive to renovate buildings has resulted in the upgrading of old residential neighborhoods where 17th and 18th century buildings had fallen into disrepair. There were uh, many streets in Newburyport at the time that we first moved here uh, that we were afraid to buy in because of the, the neighborhood was so bad. Uh, although there were many good early houses on these streets, they were just in such total disrepair, in, in, in such a, a wretched state that uh, we were afraid to, to buy in the neighborhood and live in it. Um, but now there isn't a street in Newburyport that I would be afraid to buy on or afraid to uh, begin a restoration. I, you know, you just have such a positive feeling that you know it's going to come uphill, that any good early structure will be restored. People spent hundreds and, and literally thousands of hours stripping away the, the centuries of caked up paint on the house. And, uh, you know, that, that brought a, a value to it that, that someone can prize. If, if you take off uh, you know, 20, 20 coats of paint and uh, you expose the original detail, then you're just exposing the, the beauty of the, uh, the feature itself. And, and that, that brings back a value to it. Although their efforts have transformed the neighborhoods, not all the effects have been positive. Increasing property values have compelled many of the older residents to leave. In the restoration of old buildings, history has provided the inspiration for design. In the construction of new buildings, design direction has not been as clear. The first new building proposed for Newbury Ports downtown as part of the urban renewal program was to be constructed near Market Square on land cleared in the demolition of the 1960s. 
The building was to be adjacent to a row of Federalist commercial buildings, part of that large group rebuilt after the fire of 1811. The proposal was met with strong public opposition, led by a group calling themselves Friends of the Newburyport Waterfront. Our objections to the new building were um, its, its outrageous incompatibility with the, the historic buildings that were being rehabilitated in, in the area, that the, the building in no way uh, uh, conformed or blended uh, with, with the old buildings. We, we did not object to the fact that it was not uh, uh, a reproduction. We objected to the fact that the materials and the scale and the size and, and uh, the whole character of the building was just completely incompatible. And, and uh, it, it, it incensed uh, many, many citizens. The only recourse the citizens had was to uh, speak out, to come to the meetings, and to in invoke due process of law when that was available to us. A battle ensued. On one side were people who felt that the proposed building threatened the historic character of Market Square. On the other side was a redevelopment board that had been diligent in seeking developers and who felt that new construction in the renewal area was vital to the town's economy. Well, truthfully, I didn't really like the building, for, you know, the building as it is, but I thought it would be all right. I, I felt uh, because of the, the tax return it would bring, it would be an asset. I, I thought it was all right to have something different. I didn't want to have the same identical thing that we have. The design itself, I mean, I... I think if we had a better design, maybe I could have chosen a better design. In the absence of a satisfactory design solution, the debate was presented to the National Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Market Square had been identified as an important historic asset and selected for the National Register of Historic Places, making any new construction in the urban renewal area subject to federal review. The council ruled that the proposed building was inappropriate to its site. The decision to prohibit construction came just as groundbreaking began. The building was never built. My feeling was that uh, we certainly had had enough knowledge and review of the structure that was being proposed to know that it certainly uh, was compatible to the downtown area. Some people don't agree, and this is where we come to our major disagreement on the uh, redevelopment downtown. I feel very strongly that we're, this is 1974. And uh, we've done our job as a uh, very uh, progressive community in restoring all the old buildings of the downtown area. I don't think we should get in the problem of imitating uh, buildings built in 1813, but that we should have something to leave to our future generations of people here, something that we did, something that the, our, our particular generation did, uh, something to leave to our children. And that we should also have our own line of buildings, our architectural uh, uh, design, not that it should be so different, but that it should be something that's different from what was there. And I think the uh, Parcel 8 structure was still one of the better look looking buildings of design that I've seen. How different should new buildings be? To assess the impact of new construction on Market Square, the Advisory Council required an environmental impact study. The study suggests ways to define the qualities of compatibility between one building and another. The approach can be used to develop guidelines for the design of new buildings. What is the overall massing of adjacent buildings? The height, width, and depth. What are the proportions of the individual buildings and their relationship to one another? What are the major building elements? In this case, a base of granite posts and beams, a two-story brick face, and a double-pitched roof. What are the minor relationships? Features such as doorways and windows, and roof elements like firewalls and chimneys. What about the character of detail? Can it be carried into new construction? And finally, the actual materials, their color and texture. All these qualities can be measured and applied to new construction. Most frequently, they're not.
Mercury port is no exception. New development in an old urban setting is difficult enough in areas where the past is coherent. When the past has been destroyed, the problem of creating suitable building design and defining land use is more complex. On Newburyport's waterfront, historic tradition called for an architecture whose character was conducive to easy pedestrian movement to the water's edge. Most of the redevelopment proposals made for this site as part of the urban renewal program did not reflect the importance of public access, the right of the townspeople to use the waterfront as a public place. Historically, public access had been guaranteed by law. In the 19th century, alleys or passageways between buildings allowed freedom of movement to and from the water. These passageways evolved from a tradition which existed from the beginning of the town's history. Newburyport's original coastline was considered common ground. As commercial activity, such as boat building, developed, it became necessary to subdivide areas of waterfront for private use, as had been done for agricultural property inland. Though the waterfront lots were privately owned, the public's right to cross the property was legally protected. By 1660, two wharves had been built to accommodate the loading and unloading of boats. At the peak of maritime trade in 1826, wharves dominated the waterfront. The finger-like projections simplified the transfer of cargo from large sailing vessels to dockside warehouses. By 1880, many of the docks had been filled to provide new land for the construction of factories and mills. In those parts of the waterfront where the wharves remain, the traditions of public access continued. In areas where wharves had given way to coal sheds, the possibilities of public use of the waterfront disappeared. Rail yards built along the waterfront cut across the traditional paths of access to the water. Newburyport, in developing an industrial waterfront, had built a wall between herself and the river. Though the rail yards are gone, the pattern of industrial use continues to separate the town from the river. The redevelopment of the waterfront creates a unique opportunity to re-establish public uses along the river's edge. Defining an appropriate architectural character for the waterfront has become a major question for the city as well as for the developers and architects who have participated in the urban renewal process. It is, seems to me so uh, obvious that this, uh, this location should be a generally public kind of place, which means that in the development process, the developers must find uses that serve the broadest spectrum of, uh, of the public. What kinds of, of uses could these be? Well, it uh, would certainly be shops. In a place like this, you'd find restaurants. You might find an, a hotel or an inn. Public uses and public access water. are only two of many questions. What should be the character of individual building design? Should the developer be allowed to own the land as well as the buildings? How much parking should the site have to accommodate? Should there be public boating docks or a promenade along the water's edge? In seeking direction to help answer these questions, the patterns of history are providing insight about how to both generate and interpret urban design. I think we all have agreed that it has made us acutely aware of the history and that a government agency cannot play uh, maliciously, let's say, with history, particularly as it pertains to the buildings in Market Square or in downtown Newburyport, as it pertains to the waterfront. I think that probably, that awareness, that uh, monitoring by the friends has been good. Um, I don't think anybody denies this, that it has kept us on our toes. 
and we have been ever uh, increasingly aware it has caused us to to research more what we're doing and to be more sensitive to what the community wants. there was a festival of homecoming. In recent years, more and more people have come to experience the city and celebrate New England history. Homecoming takes place only one week a year in Newburyport, at which time there is an outpouring of community spirit and an overt recognition of the importance of history as a communal experience. to preserve an architectural heritage, each new addition, be it a street, a building, a park, or something like a street light or sign, becomes a link between the past and the future.